Oh, well, my, your kindness, I, I've got no direct connection with the experimentalists, <laughs> the theorists, and, but there is a fun connection, um, I think. Uh, in, I did my, my bachelor's degree, my undergraduate degree in the 1980s, early 1980s, and in 1982, I took my first quantum mechanics course. And the quantum mechanics course was taught by a wonderful guy called John Martin. And, but we calculated, you know, we, things like energy levels of the hydrogen atom. We would calculate spins and in magnetic fields, stern gear like experiments, and it all worked beautifully. But we just calculate and, and using, using sort of Heis Schrodinger equation and solving this. And then at the end, he said, well, okay, we've seen how brilliantly it works. Here's, a, here's something that um, Einstein, who of course got a Nobel Prize, not for relativity, he got it for his work on the photoelectric effect, which is quantum mechanics. Einstein was not very happy with the elements of, of quantum theory. And he, he, so he told us, John told us, you should go and read this four page paper written in 1935 by Einstein, Rosen and Podolsky, in which they sort of set up a, a, tr a, a test case of thought experiment, which sort of shows the limitations of understanding quantum mechanics, you, know, you, you create two particles to mix them together um, so that they kind of uh, are bound or what um, Heiser, uh, Schrodinger called entangled and then you move them apart and then you do an experiment on this one and this, these could be millions of miles apart in principle, you do an experiment on this one to determine some property of it and it immediately tells you what the what this one is. You haven't even looked at this one, but you know exactly the property of this. And you can do the same. You can look at a different property on this, and it will tell you what the property of this is. And Einstein just kind of naturally said, this can't be right. This looks like it's, he called it spooky action at a distance. So my teacher was telling us this, and, and I began thinking, oh my God, yeah, what, what's, what's going on here? You know, what, how's the signal gone from there to there to explain it? And... Um, and he said, the teacher went on to say, well, this guy, David Bohm, he also was worried by this following, having read Einstein's work, this par paradox. And he said, he came up with an idea called, which became known as hidden variables. And he wrote some papers in which he sort of, the idea there is quantum mechanics isn't the be all and end all. There's something else sort of underneath it, if you like, some variables which are playing roles, in which case, in this case, the two particles would not actually know what their properties really are. And so it wouldn't be a surprise that when you went out here, did a measurement, th this one was the value it was because they were already embedded in the hidden variables. And he said, um, and that then led John Bell to come up with his test because John Bell was also a skeptic in the sense of he didn't really like the idea that quantum mechanics was providing us with this, this uh, kind of instantaneous result. He came up with a test which he, th he, he heard about David Bohm's work. He read it, being the brilliant guy he was, he realized he could come up with some, math some cor look, look for some correlations between events and see what they should be in the hidden variables theory and compare them to what they should be in the quantum mechanics case. And he realized, and this is what Mike talks about, there is a bound that emerges in the hidden variables theory that all these correlations have to be less than this given bound, but it's possible in the quantum mechanics case, because you can have these extreme correlations, that it can be bigger than this bound. And then that's the experimentalists, the three experimentalists actually got interested in, in this paper of Bell's and they, they've they got their Nobel Prize because they actually went and developed experiments which tested this Bell's inequality and found that it was always being violated. But my, my little connection is uh, at the end of the lecture, he said to us, uh, and for those of you who are interested, David Bohm is actually a professor at Birkbeck. It's 1982, and he's giving a, a, a lecture today on the aspect experiment because he's, he's, he's aware of it. And he said, you, you might want to go. So me and my mate, Mike Wilkinson, said, we haven't got a clue what's going on. <laughs> we barely knew what a wave function was. We'd only taken one course in quantum mechanics, but it sounded important. <laughs> so we said, well, let's go and we'll have a beer afterwards. So, so we, we went, we trudged a lot across London from King's College, where we were, to Birkbeck. Uh, we found the room. There was only about 20 people in the room. Um, and um, David Bohm was there. He was, quite, you know, he was a very senior professor by then. And um, 
he, he introduced the, as to the idea of hidden variables. This is what, you know, I'm talking 40 years ago. So you have to bear this in mind. I, I might not even, wasn't even sure what his conclusions were in the end, but I think I know what they were. And he was telling us about the hidden variables. And then he told us about the aspect experiment, uh, which was stunning. I do remember thinking that because aspect had introduced these amazing f switches, which would, as the, as the particles or the photons were moving from, from their source outwards, the switches would be going millions of times a second and so that it would determine which detector the particle went to. There was a randomness in it and that was really important. But um, he then went on just to say, uh, and indeed it looks like local hidden variable theories are, are, are ruled out by this because of this, the results are bigger than this uh, bound that uh, Bell had um, de derived. But he said, but that doesn't actually rule out hidden variable theories, he said. And he, he produced a, a sort of some modifications of it, which were perfectly, <laughs> from what I remember, were perfectly okay. And in fact, then I, that then prompted us, he then produced a book called Wholeness and the Implicate, Im, Wholeness and the Implicate Order, I think it's called. And um, he said, you might want to read about it in this book. <laughs> so we went, <laughs> and indeed we went on the way back past Foyle's bookshop and, and bought the book. <laughs> you brought it with you? Yeah. <laughs> Here it is. All this in the implicate order. That's the actual copy. Yeah. <laughs> ...space telescope image of the galaxy. And it might also give you some idea of the scale and the fact that it just doesn't fit on the Hubble CCD. And you can really see those dark dust bands there. And essentially what they do is block visible light. It's essentially hiding what's behind that in the galaxy from that region.